Oh, now it's working? Oh, nice working. Uh, thank you, thank you, thanks. Okay, uh, welcome back. Uh, my name is Gail Chunan. I'm uh, the session for this access control session. Uh, in this session, we have two papers. So the first paper will be presented by Talia Linger. She's from uh, University of Washington. Uh, she has PhD students. Uh, she's been working on this topic for two years. That's what I heard. So uh, she will talk about user-driven access control. So let's welcome Talia. Hi, uh, my name is Talia Ringer, uh, and I'm a student at the University of Washington. Uh, and today I'm going to be talking about Audacious. Uh, so this is work that I did with Dan Grossman and Franzi Rossner. Uh, so let's talk about flashlights. Uh, you probably expect your flashlight to do exactly one thing, and that's light up the room. Uh, you probably don't expect your flashlight to tag your location without telling you. Uh, and you almost definitely don't expect your flashlight to then like, send that off to advertising networks. Uh, well, then you're in bad luck if you downloaded Brightest Flashlight Free. Uh, this is one of the top free flashlight applications in Android. And there was recently an FTC suit in the US that ruled against it uh, for doing precisely this. Uh, so it was tagging users' locations, and it was sending them off to advertisers without telling them. And this really doesn't seem to be a one-off with, uh, with flashlight applications. So you know, maybe users should just stop installing them. Uh, after all, Android finally has its own native flashlight. Uh, so that's it, and you can all go home now. <laughs> OK, but in reality, um, you know, the root cause of this isn't that users need to just stop being so naive. Um, or that Android should have a native application for every single functionality. Uh, the root cause is in the access control models uh, that these operating systems typically use. Uh, so op mobile operating systems typically rely on some combination of runtime and install time prompts. Uh, so runtime prompts, like the one you see on the left, um, you'll see in iOS and in uh, newer versions of Android for some permissions. And these will pop up the first time that you try to access a permission um, and it will ask you if this application should be able to access this. And install time prompts, like the one you see on the right, uh, you'll see for older versions of Android. Um, and this will show up when you first install the application, and it will ask you then. Uh, but both of these are problematic, uh, so users find these really confusing. Uh, with the install time prompt in particular, uh, users tend not to even read these. But even if you have this runtime prompt, uh, which is a significant improvement, uh, this still really isn't sufficiently granular. Um, what happens here is you're granting it permission to access this resource uh, the first time it, it tries to access it. And then if you want to revoke it, uh, you have to go in and you have to do this manually. Uh, so you could imagine if you had like a camera application, you would probably want it to only take sh pictures uh, when you actually press this camera button. Uh, but in this model, um, it could take pictures pretty much whenever it wants until you go in and you revoke that access. So user-driven access control uh, is an existing approach that addresses these problems. Uh, and this is really exactly what it sounds like. Uh, so it's access control, but it takes the mechanism for access control, and it moves it where the user actually expects it. Uh, so in other words, all the time when you're interacting with these applications, uh, you're implicitly communicating that you expect them to access certain resources. Uh, so when you press the center location button, uh, you probably expect the application to access your location. And if you press the microphone button, uh, then you expect it to listen to your audio. Uh, but in the um, models that you see in iOS and in Android, uh, there's no guarantee this is actually true. Uh, so user-driven access control takes these elements, uh, and it turns them into designated access control gadgets. Um, so basically, what they've done is they've gone in and they've modified the operating system uh, so that the operating system actually owns these UI elements. Um, and the um, they're the only way to actually access these resources. Uh, so the application will delegate a part of its screen uh, to the operating system, um, and that's how it will actually access this resource. So if the application goes and they make like a fake center location button or something like this, uh, this doesn't actually matter because this can't actually access the resource. Only these operating system owned elements can do that. Um, so this is a great idea, and this is something that we'd really love to get out to users. Um, but there's one problem. Uh, so the existing user-driven access control approach uh, relies on modifying the operating system. And this makes it hard to actually get it out. 
Uh, so here's a graph of the distribution of uh, Android versions on, um, on uh, devices that have recently checked into the Google Play Store. And one thing you'll notice um, is that the latest Android that's listed here is actually Android 6 at only 18.7%. Um, Android 6 had actually been out for over a year when I pulled this graph. Uh, the latest Android was Android 7, which had been released when I pulled this graph, um, but actually hadn't like, reached a significant enough uh, percentage of users to even make it on here. Uh, so we enforce user-driven access control without modifying the operating system because this is a great idea and we'd really like to get this out. So the way we do, um, so we enforce the same two guarantees as the original user-driven access control approach, um, which is that uh, the application accesses the right resource at the right time. Um, we also take it one step further. Um, the original approach uh, placed no guarantees on how the resource was used or where the resource flowed. Um, after it was accessed, but we can actually say something about that too. Uh, so if you have a simple camera application, uh, one that you expect just to take photos and save to your device, uh, no advanced functionality, um, then you expect it to actually take a picture, uh, not listen to your audio. Uh, you expect it to take this picture when you press the camera button, uh, not when your screen is locked. Um, and you expect it to save it to your device, uh, not send it over the internet to a total stranger. Uh, so this kind of evil application is exactly what we're trying to defend against. So the way we do this is by combining a secure library with some program analyses. Uh, so the secure library is what makes it so that applications can actually use this approach. Um, and there are extra precautions that we take to actually make this secure, uh, and we discuss this in the paper. Uh, the program analysis is what makes sure these applications are actually using our library correctly. Uh, so to see how this all fits together, um, the application will include our library, um, which also has some dynamic analyses. Uh, and one thing to note here is that we're actually in the same execution context as the application. Um, so we focus our implementation efforts on Android where this is true. Um, basically what this means is that anything that we can do, um, the application can also do. So there's a lot more that we have to think about than if we hadn't modified the operating system. Uh, so once this is done, uh, this will go through some static analysis tools. Um, and then there's an auditing step. And the reason this is here is that any sound static analysis is going to have some false positives. Uh, so we need a way to actually deal with those. Uh, we need a way to know, like, are these actually false positives or are these malicious behavior? Uh, so we pull this auditing model from one of the underlying analyses that we use called Sparta. Um, and so this is just an App Store approval model uh, where the auditor will approve or reject uh, before it's actually released. So this is only one possible model. Um, the overall approach is independent of this. Uh, so you could imagine, you could substitute an alternative model here. Uh, for example, uh, rather than requiring uh, applications to do this, you could incentivize them by having a third party organization certify applications that are compliant. So the adversary we're defending against um, is a skilled developer. Uh, and again, there's a lot we have to think about because we're in the same execution context. Uh, so anything that we can do, the application can also do. Uh, so this developer could try to misuse our library. Uh, they could try to mislead the user. Um, or they could try to bypass the library altogether. Uh, and one thing to note here is that uh, another place where this auditing step becomes useful uh, is that we can like, make sure they're using the correct version of the library and so on. Uh, so to actually enforce this, uh, we combine a secure library with a program analysis, uh, the library so they can use it, and the analysis so that we can make sure they're using it correctly. Um, and this library, um, I'm going to show you like, what this actually looks like. Uh, so if you have a camera ACG uh, for your camera application, what this actually is is something called a fragment. Uh, so a fragment in Android is typically a small isolated part of a screen, uh, so something like a button. Uh, so this makes it a natural place to implement an access control gadget. And to actually use a fragment, uh, you call your fragment manager and you pass it some ID. Uh, so this fragment has a user interface and it also has some logic associated with it. Um, so this ID uh, will correspond to an ID in your view XML, which is just where you list all of the UI elements that you're going to use in Android. Uh, so once you've included this element, you need a way of knowing uh, when the user has actually interacted with it. 
So in other words, when you're allowed to use that resource. Uh, so Android is very event driven, so we just continue along this paradigm. Uh, and the application will implement a listener, and this listener will be notified when the resource is actually available uh, and when it can use it. Uh, the application can also chain ACGs together. Uh, so you could imagine if you have an audio ACG that records audio um, and a speaker ACG that plays it, uh, you can pass input from the audio into the speaker. So once you've included this and the application can actually use this, uh, we then need to guarantee that they're actually using it correctly, uh, the, accessing the right resource at the right time, and then using the right flow. Uh, and this is really where our program analysis comes in. So for the right resource, what we really care about is that there's deliberate user interaction with a UI that looks like it's going to access that resource. Uh, and this is really two separate things. Uh, the first thing is that the interaction is actually coming from the user. Um, because we're in user space, uh, we don't have control over events and when they're created, so we need to make sure that the application isn't uh, pretending to be the user here. Uh, the second part of it is that this interaction is deliberate. Uh, so basically, the user was not tricked into interacting with this UI. So once you have deliberate user interaction, um, we then need to ensure that the uh, resource is accessed at the right time. Uh, so in other words, uh, when the user has actually interacted with this ACG. And then finally, uh, we want to check the right flow, uh, how the resource is actually used after it's accessed. So when you put all of these together, you get our three guarantees. Um, and we enforce this in three phases. So the first of these is making sure that events actually come from the user. Uh, so if we have a simple camera application, um, then we want it to you know, take a picture when we press this button. Uh, but we need to make sure that it's not the application pressing this button. Uh, and we also need to make sure that the application isn't, say, intercepting a valid button press to uh, you know, this flash button and moving it where the camera button is. Um, so both of these are event forgery attacks, and these are things we have to think about in user space. Uh, so to enforce this, what we really have to do is make sure that the application does not interfere at all with the flow of events uh, from the user to the UI that the, the user sees. Uh, and so we enforce this statically with an event analysis. The reason we do this statically uh, is that if we were to do it dynamically, um, so this needs to happen for every single event that flows uh, th to this ACG UI. And if you do this dynamically, uh, this could incur a lot of performance overhead. Uh, so we do this statically. Um, and the way that this works is that uh, you can think of this as a taint analysis, where any application interference with an event uh, taints or invalidates the event. Uh, so application interference could be creating the event or it could be intercepting it. Um, or more conservatively, uh, you could just prevent applications from creating and modifying events altogether. Um, so there are valid reasons to create and modify events. Uh, so we discussed the trade-offs of these two approaches in the paper. Uh, so once you have a guarantee that this, uh, or this um, you know, that the event really came from the user, you then want to make sure that this interaction was deliberate, so that you have, the user was not tricked uh, into interacting with it. Um, and so this is also something we have to think about in user space, because we don't have a global view of the UI. Um, operating systems don't let uh, applications typically take system-level screenshots, because this would impose a security risk. Uh, so we need to make sure, um, so we have a lot more that we have to think about uh, than if we were to modify the operating system for this. Uh, so for our camera application, we want this to actually be a camera button um, and not something else. And this can happen in several ways. Uh, so they could do this from within the application uh, by covering this camera button or by changing its appearance. Or they could do this outside of the application. Uh, for example, using a system level pop-up uh, that covers the camera button, uh, but then delegates events downward. Um, and some operating systems let applications create these system level pop-ups. Uh, so Android has something like this. It's called a toast uh, because it pops up. And, uh, you, so we need to actually think about this. We need to make sure that this isn't happening too. Uh, and one other way they could do this is by tricking the check altogether. 
Uh, so you could imagine you're about to press this like fake camera button, and then as soon as you're about to press it, the application swaps it out for a real camera button. Uh, so this is called a bait and switch attack. And if we implement our check naively, uh, then what we're going to get is the real camera button, because that's what they pressed. But the user didn't actually have enough time to perceive this camera button. Uh, so we need to defend against this kind of attack as well. So all of these are clickjacking attacks. Uh, and the root cause of clickjacking from a paper called Clickjacking Attacks and Defenses is that the UI is presented out of context. So we need to make sure that the UI is in context, and we have our own check for this. Uh, and this check happens dynamically. The reason that we do this dynamically is that we need information both about what the UI looked like and about when it looks that way uh, relative to any possible user event. Um, so any, existing approaches that do this actually rely on like a manual bitmap comparison. So they'll have someone sitting there and comparing these bitmaps to see uh, if this makes sense. Uh, so we instead have like an automatic bitmap comparison. Um, and this happens per ACG. So each ACG can define what it means uh, for this UI to be acceptable. Uh, so this could be exact equality, like the camera button should always look exactly this way. Um, or this could be, you could say that the uh, application should be able to scale the camera button in certain ways and so on. Um, we don't actually handle issues of human perception here. Uh, so this is out of scope of both the original work and our work. Uh, but we do expose this mechanism, which allows ACGs to define what is acceptable. And then we can check this dynamically. And we have extra logic to deal with these other attacks that we have to think about outside of the UI and uh, tricking the check. Uh, so if you're interested in those, then you should read the paper. So finally, we when we have deliberate user interaction, we then need to make sure the application is actually accessing and using resources correctly. Uh, so if we have our camera application, then we want it to take a picture when we press the button, uh, and we want it to save the photo. So taking pictures with our screen is locked would be an illegal access, and then sending it off to evil.com would be a legal flow. So both of these are illegal resource flows. And you can think of resources as information. So then resource flow just becomes an information flow problem. Uh, and so we have a static information flow that checks this. Uh, so in particular, we build on top of Sparta, uh, which is a static information flow tool for Android. Um, and we expose this notion of an ACG in Sparta. Um, and we can then check that resources actually come from this ACG. Um, and then we can also check something about the flow of those resources from then on. Uh, so Sparta, uh, in particular, applications will implement something called a flow policy file, uh, which says which flows are acceptable. And then Sparta can guarantee that those are actually held. Um, now, it's the auditor who actually makes sure that that flow policy is like a sane flow policy, but Sparta can guarantee that it actually holds for the application. Uh, so when you put this all together, uh, we get our three guarantees, the right resource, right time, and right flow. Uh, so we built this into five test applications. Um, so these are open source applications. We needed to modify them to actually build our library into them. Um, we picked them from FDroid, and we selected them for uh, varying permission uses and varying complexity. Uh, and there's a lot that we learned from this. Um, so I'm only going to talk about two things, uh, but if you're interested, then you can find a lot more in the paper. So the first thing we found is that ACGs encapsulate existing behavior. Uh, so we have this application called Speed of Sound. And what Speed of Sound does is it adjusts the volume of your phone depending on how fast you're driving. Uh, so you can actually hear your music when you're driving fast. Uh, so Speed of Sound has this checkbox that says Enable Speed of Sound. And when you check it, it actually accesses your location. And when you uncheck it, it doesn't access your location. Uh, so this is great. This really acts like an ACG already. Uh, and we actually found that three of five applications uh, had UI elements that acted like ACGs. And in those applications, integrating our library actually decreased code size uh, because we're encapsulating two things. We're encapsulating both this user interaction and this resource accessing behavior. Uh, surprisingly, even in the other two applications that did not have elements like this, uh, we found that integrating our library only slightly increased code size. Um, and the reason this, this increase was so minor is that even though we had to add new user interaction, we were still encapsulating this resource accessing behavior. Another thing we learned is that flexibility is desirable. Uh, so with speed of sound, um, this checkbox 
Uh, this makes sense to implement as an ECG. You can check this before you drive, and then you listen to your music, and then when you're done, you uncheck it. Uh, so this is fine. Uh, but Speed of Sound has another uh, functionality here, and this is a song map. And what this does is it takes the song that you're listening to, and it actually saves it along the route that you're driving. Uh, so this is really cool. Like, you might really want something like this. Um, it'd be fun to look at. Uh, so, um, but it really doesn't make sense to use an ACG for this, uh, because you're driving, so you're not going to, you know, approve of every single song every time. Uh, so we actually found that all five applications had permission uses for which ACGs weren't ideal. Um, and uh, one huge benefit of our approach is that this is actually possible. Uh, so in particular, because of our use of Sparta, uh, you can um, define a flow policy that says, you know, all location access should come from this ACG, uh, but I want to be able to save songs to the map this way. Uh, and the auditor would look and make sure that this is actually okay. So you can actually combine these models. So we set out to do this without modifying the operating system, uh, and we succeeded. Uh, but in doing so, we actually found some opportunities for operating systems. Uh, so in particular, there are some simple features that operating systems can implement uh, that go a very long way. So they don't need to implement all of user-driven access control. These are just small things that really help not, not just us, but also other secure libraries. Um, and I'm again only going to talk about two, but there is more in the paper. Uh, so the first of these is flagging synthetic events. Uh, so if you remember, um, our event analysis uh, we do this statically because there would be a lot of performance overhead to check this for every event that flows to the, uh, to the UI. But this isn't true if there's a flag at the system level that actually checks this for us. Um, so we actually found that Android had something that looked like it was supposed to do this uh, called flag tainted, uh, but it was uh, like private so you couldn't access it. Um, it was undocumented and it was never set in any of our attacks. Uh, so we think that maybe they're trying to do this, uh, but right now it doesn't work. Um, second of these is flagging external UI overlays. Uh, so for these system level pop-up attacks, uh, because the operating system isn't going to let us take system level screenshots, we need a way of knowing when there's something on top of our application. So Android actually does have something for this. It's called flag window is obscured. And this is a huge benefit. Uh, this, is, this makes our job way easier for checking these external attacks. Uh, but there are some bugs here um, in this flag. Uh, so in particular, if your view is only partially obscured, then right now this flag is never set, even though the documentation says that it should be. Uh, so we've reported this bug to Android, and they are working on fixing this. Uh, so I want to emphasize that these features go a long way. Uh, so this isn't useful just for user-driven access control. Uh, you could imagine, for example, an ad library uh, might be very interested in knowing when the application is making like fake events to click on ads um, or whether it's actually coming from the user. Uh, so these are simple features that operating systems can implement that make it much easier to implement these secure libraries. Uh, so that's it, uh, and I can take questions. Right, any questions? Go ahead. Paul Van Orschot, Carleton University. A great talk. Um, it looks like you're solving or, or trying to solve uh, part of the general longstanding um, trusted path problem. So I'm just wondering if you could say a few words about the relationship between your work and, and the trusted path problem. I'm sorry, what is the trusted path problem? Well, b basically, the, you know, the user, you, you want user input to go directly to the operating system and, and, and operating system um, signals coming directly back to the user. Uh, without um, being fooled in between. Okay. Some kind um, of information flow analysis. Information flow. Well, I mean, j just in, in general.